over to you. It would be fantastic to have a really lively uh, discussion and debate about some of these topics. I don't know whether uh, some of the, the topics that you heard felt, you felt resonated with you, there were some things that you didn't think were possible, some questions you might have. Um, but I'd be delighted to hand over for any, any questions from the floor. I'll try and take uh, twos, or, twos or threes if I can. So I'll take one from Peter. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, one from Debbie. So, uh, Peter, would you? I think the microphone should be on, so it should be okay. So it should be working. I was rather hoping we were going to get a spread of Christmas lunch on a sandwich. <laughs> and they were going to get a torture sandwich out there earlier. <laughs> um, Brooks, uh, in some ways, what's got some of your ideas to the DFE? Because my point is about morale already. And as leaders, we're all optimistic, we're all relentlessly optimistic, we work in challenging schools. Um, I was just, we can go through a period of criticism like that. And I think that there it seems to be, I don't know, an emerging consensus. I don't think maybe I'm being relentlessly optimistic. And I think there's a time now for joint engagement again. And I think that it needs to be taken because of what was said by you in different ways. Because otherwise we're not going to get the leaders of the future. Some of our teaching leaders won't want to go on, potentially. Uh, and we I've got some anecdotal and also factual evidence that there are less young people want to become teachers at the moment. Rules because of what was said about the education system. So I think we owe it to ourselves to try and re engage now or around certain things, but to think about that morale side of things because I do fear for the service if we don't do something about that at the moment. Uh, and I fear for young people. And I think what you said about leadership is quite interesting, isn't it? I'm quite interested in leadership from outside. You know, look at how somebody that I admire General Slew, the way he led the 14th Army, and Sansi Chi, the way she leads her, who is leading her country. It's about giving people optimism, isn't it? And I think we try and do that day in, day out. I think we need a bit of help from outside providers, uh, because I, otherwise I don't think we're going to get the quality into the education system, as we have been getting in the last few years, and I do agree with what's been said here, we may not retain them, and I think that will be uh, a shame. Debbie? Thank you. I think what I'm going to say probably follows on from uh, what my colleague has just said. It's more of a, a comment, really, rather than a question. Um, like Sue, sorry, Sue, I've almost done my time. I um, <coughs> started my career in the 1970s before some people here were even born. Um, and I don't work in London, I work in Kent. Kent is selective um, and that has its own range of issues. And I run uh, as part of an academy trust three non-selected schools, uh, one rural, one all boys, and one uh, in particular challenging circumstances. If I go back to the early 1980s, uh, my career took off when the head of my first school saw something, I don't know what, um, and made me an assistant head of year. Um, I didn't have any pay for that. Um, in fact, she didn't ask me, she just told me that I had to turn up to an evening and introduce me to all the staff and the parents as the new deputy head of the year, which was slightly embarrassing when people began to ask me questions. Um, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that our very earliest experience of those who lead us is crucial. Uh, and there are far too many people who don't have a positive experience of that first leadership. Um, Sue, you mentioned governments, um, and that's a, a massive issue. Uh, I'm not really talking about paying governors and making them accountable uh, to offset, uh, but really I suppose I'm talking about the work that we here in this room, because you preach in front, I know this preach, but we are the converted. We've got a massive job of work to do in converting others to think the same as we do uh, and to take risks. Debbie, and I, I think actually I'll, I'll, I'll throw in one question that came in um, before this session actually, which I think links quite well to the things that have come up, which is um, whether we think that schools are now uh, better than they've ever been, and if so, do you think that it's said often enough by politicians, and do you think that it would, if it were said often it might be a way of the professionals who are receiving the message that we can still do a lot better, which is a question that came in earlier. So I think one question around morale and optimism and how that important that is. Uh, and uh, both, both in terms of externally but also within the school, a question around leadership and actually how strong leaders can convert.
convert others, and a question about the message I think coming to the uh, profession from, from government as well. I don't know whether any, any one of the panelists on that um, I, mean, I, th I think the three questions link really, really well together. Uh, and Peter's point uh, about morale, I think, is, is very, very timely. Uh, I thought you were going to say morale in the DfE when you started to go to DfE and, and morale. But I'll take it more broadly to be morale uh, across the whole of the education system, particularly uh, in schools. And I think your reference, uh, Peter, to optimism and to some of the examples like Aung San Suu Kyi, it reminded me a bit of working with Tim Brickhouse, because I think one of the things that Tim always brings is this incredible energy, enthusiasm, but optimism. And I remember when we were looking at uh, the schools in London that needed to do better. And what were we going to call those schools? And this was the second term of, of Tony Blair's government, and there'd been the whole business in the first term of naming and shaming. And I was really determined, and Tim even more so, that we would not go down the route of Maybe and shaming. And the phrase that some of you may remember that Tim came up with was the keys to success. And I that was a beautiful way of making exactly the same point, but making it in a way that was about bringing people together, an effort that would be uh, collaborative. And you know, that links really to the question that had come in in advance because I don't think we as politicians can say often enough we have the best ever generation of teachers. Ofsted say that, we have the best ever generation of school leaders, including head teachers, and we have the best ever schools. And I don't think that is in any sense complacent to say that. That's not to say everything's perfect, it's not to say it's the same everywhere, but there is a way of making a point about con the continued need for further improvement that starts with the truth, which is, as Peter said, that we have that best ever generation, so we can say it because it's true, but also if people need to improve, if the system needs to further improve, it's far more likely that that's going to happen if it's in the context of a shared approach and a consensus. And I certainly don't buy the argument that I think is sometimes made that that is going soft. You know, that could be caricatured, characterised, caricatured as going soft uh, on standards and, and so forth. I don't think that it's about that at all. It's actually about how you most uh, successfully achieve the improvement in standards. And if morale is low, and if the constant messages from government are that people are enemies of promise and all of the rest of it that we hear, that's going to have the effect. And the economic situation at the moment may disguise uh, a future difficulty. When the economy picks up, I think we could see some of those issues in terms of both retention and recruitment of teachers to which feet to refer. Yes, I mean, I... I Agree, and the language is really, really important. Um, as you said, in terms of Tim's use of key to success, that was absolutely crucial. And there are some, there's some publication I looked at recently that was talking about industrialising failure in our system, you know, and uh, chronic underperformance. Um, and I have, you know, some of you do know that I am on the board, and I do raise this issue. This is not a terminally ill um, situation that we're in in education. Yes, there are issues that have to be tackled, but actually I do believe we've got the best generation of teachers that we've had. I think the level of professional dialogue within schools is of a very, very high level and high caliber. Uh, and of course, the demands, as I said earlier, are even greater on individual teachers as well as individual schools. The accountability system is extreme, and yes, of course, we should be responsible for making sure we, the progress of pupils of all children, of all abilities and all different backgrounds is important. But that's a hard job. It really is hard work working in schools. The accountability, you, we have earned autonomy within the system, but it is, does sometimes feel like quite a punitive accountability system, and it's getting that balance right so that people are energised to continue and to move forward. Um, so I, I do think we, we, we can turn the corners. I, I, I'm a, always an optimist, and I do think that there are people that still want to come into this profession for reasons of moral purpose, that they believe that, very importantly, you know, that, that, that we must have a, a better, more, we need more excellence, but we also need more equity within our system. Um, so I, I, I feel that they will come in. Um, 
and it's down to us in a self-improving system to create more positive climates and, and cultures in our school. Um, but like, some, some of the language does concern me quite considerably. Thank you. Any other questions? Following up on what Peter said, I think as a middle manager, he's been teaching for nine years now. And when I first started, the, all I was to do was head teacher. And I, I now find it very unattractive to, to take up on it. Because the, the priority for me, seeing working heads I work with um, and the positions most of the time I had, is it's a more and more corporate business we to sort out. You pick them by statistics, by figures. Um, and you also get criteria that come in the last two years. I've, Transform from one to three in the space of two years because it, the, the, the boundaries have changed. And now, as I said, trying to achieve almost things possible in the classroom. And it's almost now, it, it just seems such an unattractive position. Whereas when I started the profession, one of the students, I thought I'd make a real change as a teacher. Now, as a middle manager, I'm very happy to tell you, I've been six years now. I feel I've made an impact on the day to day life of the students. My worries are going further up the chain. I've become a, a, a sort of number cruncher. I'm looking at statistics. I'm looking is, I feel, is that actually having an impact? Is that, the role, is that the moral profession I went into in the first place? Or do I want to sit where I am and just feel like I have an impact on a daily basis? So it's genuinely a conversation I've a few people to see and it's, it's quite depressing actually. Like, yeah, I've asked for this is a 40 year career and now I've had the first time in my career quite serious stance about how far I'm going to go up the food chain as well. So the way education has changed, even my very short experience, maybe nine years, it's changed. <coughs> and they say the rhetoric that comes out of press and government. Is, is there one thing that could be changed that would change what you just said? Is there, is there, is there, is there, is there a lot of different things in one thing? <laughs> if I were to sum up in one, in one example, for me, yeah. I mean, the way I've said it's completely changed the boundaries in the last two years. Right. And we're now being asked, I'm not, I've been teaching that. It's mm -hmm. why, why, why that teaching that would be old fashioned, traditional, and out of date. I'm working with my MQTs. I'm, you know, I'm not a bad teacher. You know, I'm now incredibly great two or three because there's new criteria. Right. I find it impossible. That's an example. So you're trying to sell the last yeah. 40 years teachers being poor teachers because suddenly the criteria has changed and what we're expected to do now is, is, is outstanding. Whereas three years ago, you know, what's outstanding is now poor. I find that very hard as a tip. I find it very depressing to us. I've got I've started all over again after nine years, which is, which is quite depressing. Yeah. Thank you. Take press and Yeah, I think it's about professional bravery. I think it's much harder to be brave now than it was ten years ago. And how you culture, how you create a culture that allows people and nurtures bravery and allows them to try new things. I think your point. I, I came ahead eleven years ago, and it was easier to make mistakes eleven years ago. And I think as a new head now, I would be, feel quite pressure. I've reached the point where I can say I'll bugger it really now. Um, <laughs> if it all goes wrong, it all goes wrong. And that's a really healthy position to be in. Mm -hmm. And how we can protect our less experienced colleagues to be able to feel the same, I think is really good. I love your examples. I'm really pleased to practice our wild cards. We give out things like all the time. I think it is about being relentlessly positive and relentlessly optimistic. But I don't think the system cultivates that enough. And I think there's responsibility on whatever the system is mm -hmm. to constantly be sending positive messages out. So I know if I'm told I'm good, I'm also better, I'm better able to hear the message, but I could be better mm -hmm. than if I'm damned. And I think that's really important. All the networks Sue was talking about could could, 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 could nurture that bravery. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I saw one more hand in front. Yeah. It's a bit of a follow-on from from that general discussion. I wrote the question down a little while ago because I was, I was really impressed by a number of you talking about innovation and I think, as, as you feel, it, it, it doesn't feel like we're in an environment where innovation is valued really at the moment. Um, so given that, as the champions of innovation, and, and I know Stephen, you can't reverse everything that's happened <laughs> over the last, uh, but, but what would be the one thing you would reverse? Which would allow us that freedom to feel that the innovation we want to uh, we want to create could happen. It's interesting. So I, just just to summarise the different topics, and I'll come to Stephen to answer that question. So one around the thing whether actually do 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 middle leaders want to progress their careers and go on to headship, and actually how we could could change that 
one question around the parameters of how we, how do you create a culture where you can take risks and what are the parameters for risk taking? And then I think also what are the parameters for innovation? How do you push and push these forward? It's a really hard question you've asked me there and I'm, I'm struggling with it. Before you clarified at the end uh, that you meant specifically around innovation, I was going to give a different answer. Your the, opportunity for the quick, yeah. for the <laughs> what would it be? I mean, I, I think in the end, for me, it's got to be about the measures that give give the profession more power. That's a bit sort of vague, isn't it? So I like some of the stuff that the Education Select Committee came up with around a kind of Royal College of Teaching, stuff I've talked about, about evidence at the heart of policy making. So it's not a specific reversal of something that's happened, but it's a, a different approach that's a change of culture that I think re responds to some of the points that have been made. I think if I was more specific, the EBAC, you know, I think the EBAC has had a negative effect, mm -hmm. and getting rid of that would be a very straightforward thing to do, it would make a lot of sense. Um, and there are clearly issues around Ofsted that relate to, to what we've heard about today, where we need to have a serious debate about moving from a punitive approach to one that is still challenging, of course, but one that is more collaborative. Um. I think in response to you know sort of head teachers and leaders of, of today in a, in a much higher stake environment that we're in, um, I think more than ever before, particularly in an autonomous system with more freedom, more academies, we need responsible leadership. Um, it just takes one or two people to start doing things that are unethical, immoral, which makes the whole thing fracture. So there's, there's great strengths of autonomy for us, but there's also great risks if, if we don't have And again, like Tim Brickhouse, um, when we became an academy, he, um, he, he put together six principles, and we adopted those six principles, which were to do with things like, you know, playing fair with admissions, taking your fair share within your local community of children who are hard to place, all those sorts of things. And I, I think principled and responsible leadership is called for ever more now than, than, than in the past. And I, I think it is high stakes, but as a head teacher, um, what I've always done with my team is whatever is going on around, we've always gone back to our values, what we thought were our values, and tested things out against those values. And if it didn't fit, we didn't do it. Right, so there was a lot of pressure on us at one stage to get you know, very high value added, which we could have done by a particular route. We chose not to because we believed in a broad and balanced curriculum for our children. And I think whatever the environment, I think that's what you have to do. You, you have to keep with that. Um, and I, I, again, I'm optimistic. I do, but it means also that, that behaviours are really, really important. Um, and collectively, in terms of any leadership training we're involved in, in middle leadership training, senior leadership training, those behaviours and getting those right are as important as all the process stuff to do with data uh, and all of that. Because um, you can always as a head get somebody else to do that for you. <laughs> what is important is you know, the, the, the kind of the ambition, the school, the mission, the vision, the bringing people together. Um, because essentially, we all know that none of us, you know, we're only as good as the people who work with us and for us. It's as simple as that. Um, and therefore, that is, is more important to me than anything else. I see. And I was wondering, Richard, from, from a, perhaps a perspective, because I guess you're in somewhat more control of your own destiny, how you actually motivate staff to progress their careers and create a culture to take risks. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yes, I think I can't really comment on the, on the specifics around um, you know, your, your circumstance within the school, but it's definitely exactly the problem that we, we, that we see all the time. People, for example, some of our very, very successful general managers within our shops, we would see them as being the absolute prime candidate to step up and take a more generalist managerial role, or perhaps an operational manager role, and they would have a reluctance to do that because, of course, exactly as I said when I was talking previously, as a general manager within a shop, they're kind of in control of their own destinies. They have autonomy, they run their business as a powerful thing. And so I suppose where we've been most successful in this, don't get me wrong, we go it wrong a hell of a lot as well, but where we have been quite successful on the occasions where we've tried to point out and, and play out 
the idea that actually the next step, the progression to the next level, gives the individual much more chance to actually change the culture within the people that they work in. So, within the group that they work in. So, you know, I've got a, a good example. One of our guys, a chap called Saeed, one of our most successful general managers, is very reluctant to step up um, because he'd been running a shop for um, probably four years, very successfully, always one of the highest performers. And he was very, very unsure because, of course, you know, these managerial roles, exactly to your point, do have a level of bureaucracy with them. There are a little, you know, there's more politics, there is more box running, and he's not there physically day to day running the shop. But when we started to talk to him about the opportunity to share best practice within the shops, to take ideas that he'd had from his expertise and actually how he could build the culture within the shop managers that he could potentially go on to run and control, how they could be the best they could be. Once he had that mindset flip that with this, um, with this position of seniority, he could change some of the embedded belief and change some of the behavioural patterns, this was the thing that resonated for him. Now, I'm not saying that that works for everybody, but I think the key was, for us, spending time with him and understanding the support he needed to get excitement out of a new job. And for him, it was the crossover between still being broadly operational, but taking a managerial role. And so we work hard, and now he's flying, and he's, you know, he's looking to step up again. But he, we found his excitement, or he found his excitement, and was able to nurture it in a different capacity. I think we've got time for a couple more questions here. There's a question here from Tim. One question there, I'll take one question from the back as well. Thanks. Um, at the first, can I just make the, the brief point? The gentleman was talking um, at the back regarding he doesn't want to go on to headship and so on. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, but I would just say that you know, wherever you've got the information from it, um, you know, somehow you can't have a, a real significant impact on a daily basis and have uh, a wonderful, fulfilling job. It, it's simply misinformation, and I think we should chat at some point because, because um, it's, it's sad to hear. It's simply not true. Um, the, 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 the point, I want to pick up on a point that Sue was saying, and it is resonating, I think, with what Stephen was saying as well, and James, is this point about leadership behaviours being far more important than leadership titles. And there were a few um, uh, mentions about the importance of, of, of getting away from a hierarchical approach, okay, and the flat hierarchy and so on and so forth. I think the, the phrase that you used, Stephen, was freedom to innovate, and Sue said something very similar, the, the permission to innovate. And I, I think that by, um, by focusing on the importance of leadership behaviours, we can get away from some of these difficulties about people feeling they have to move to a new job, or move up, move down, the, 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 this type of, of thing. And actually, by doing that, we can um, allow people to have far more impact than they previously thought possible because of the limitations of job titles and so on. One of the things that I was talking briefly to James about before, before the, the debate this evening was about um, how leadership as a, ver as a verb is far more empowering than leadership as a noun. Okay? And, and, and the idea that uh, I am a leader, I behave in this, this type of way, is likely to have far more impact through our system and therefore to our, to our children than, um, than the notion of uh, I need to be part of a leadership, a senior leadership, a middle leadership, which actually can be very limiting okay, in, in, in terms of the perspective that people take. The irony that I was James about was that obviously teacher leaders focus on the idea of being a middle leader and so on. So I think my, my, my point, my question is, how can we create um, uh, 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 systems and training programs that promote leadership behavior over moving through a hierarchy and getting a different job? Thank you. Um, so my reflection is upon um, talent.
We have schools within the authority that I work at. Which you could plot that decline for a salary. And the decline is because you lose the core of staff who, there are staff who will stay with the school. And as we change the way that we weigh the pig and we change the measures and we continually provide a, a, a level of instability that makes people feel I can find something else. My CV will stand up a lot better if I've worked at this school. And that's also reflected in pay scales as well. If I'm not able to offer exactly the same as the school down the road, um, I'm in competition. And there is a huge commitment among states within my own authorities, a huge commitment to working in partnership, to, to looking at the ways that we can take every student within our within our run forward. But we are still very much in competition. It's public, it's league tables, it's continually changing, it's continually out of something to reflect within our staffing structures approach things to manage to maintain that. Somebody else earlier on said about being an internal optimist. It is about being optimistic. It's about finding a way forward through those challenges. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't have a mic, so have to bear with me. Um, I've just been listening to what everyone's been saying, and sort of the question, sort of the statement. It is an exciting time in, in education at the moment. Um, I might not feel overly supported in my career progression currently at my school, but I'm looking outwards. Um, teaching leaders was amazing and empowering me to keep looking outside and taking the most of the opportunities that I could. Um, currently, I'm really into Teach Me. I don't know if anybody, I know teaching leaders have currently had someone speak there. Um, it's a Twitter-based um, CPD where teachers get together and share good practice. Only 4% of teachers are on Twitter. Um, I don't ever, I've never thought of myself as someone who's very technical, but apparently I am because I'm on Twitter. Um, on Saturday, I went to a free training event for Pedigree London and it was at the Institute. People went there, dedicated teachers, delivering best practice from their schools from Liverpool. They came from all over, came to London to share good practice. It was amazing and it was enormously beneficial. Um, I think there are still a lot of people out there making a difference despite the current climate. And I think technology is something that we're not looking at enough. And you know, I'm in a school where we're not allowed to tweet. We're not allowed to do these things, which is, I understand in terms of a, a certain system, but there's an opportunity to reflect and share your best practice, which is a very low cost way, very high impact that shared more and I just want to more so because we've got all these heads here it's just to think how can you foster that within your own school Thank you, so I, th I think some interesting questions there around um, I hope you have been tweeting about the CD of course <laughs> uh, but some interesting questions about how uh, we can create systems that promote behaviours uh, that focus on leadership and, uh, and the behaviours rather than the actual job titles and what impact that might have whether actually I think, to paraphrase the question, whether talent is actually tied to more successful schools, whether it's easier to retain talent in those schools, um, and potentially a question around new ways to listen and share within the profession um, to, uh, to, to, to share those practice, maybe promote ideas and get that freedom in the Behaviours. <laughs> I mean, I do think that you can create systems that are cultural leaders in our schools as opposed to people in leadership positions. But that's down to us providing for them to lead on something that they're passionate about. So be it, I'm a, cha I'm a, a champion for critical thinking across the curriculum. I'm working on building learning power. Uh, and then you become recognized amongst your peers as a leader of learning, um, I, I think is, is really important. Um, and what really gives respect to people in the school is their ability to teach effectively. Nothing more than that. I think, you know, we, we all know that there are leaders in schools, if they cannot teach, teach effectively, their credibility is down here. Whereas there may be an AQT, well, I've got to teach first this, this, this year, and in a challenge partner review, eight weeks into teaching, they've got to one. They're teaching. That person is, is you know, really quite special but is now a cultural leader in some respects in the school. So, it, but it's the, it's the emphasis that we place on those really important other aspects of leading learning, I think, within the, within the, uh, the school. I, I do share, I mean, I, I do think it's more challenging for
all schools in different kinds of sets of circumstances. And I would like to hope that in things like teaching school alliances, that the alliance would take some responsibility for supporting colleagues. So for instance, recently in, in our, our schools direct allocation of places, I think it was quite right that a colleague said to me, yes, you want an English person, I want an English person, but I need them more than you. And for me to say, yes, you do. Right? So how can we how can we shift so that people do have that wider kind of commitment to the, the community of schools as opposed to their own individual school? There's a danger we won't we'll do that less and less though, because of the amount of measures. I think what Sue just said is my central policy conundrum because I absolutely agree uh, with what Sue said. We've got to get that into the system. I one of the I mentioned before the Academy's Commission report. Uh, leaving aside the other debates around the legislation and the academy conversion process and the, the pros and the cons of that, I think a real trick that the government's missed, and the Academy's Commission report makes this point, is that schools that were outstanding or good that converted to academy status, there was no automatic expectation that they would work with other schools that might be struggling with non-performing. And I think for me, that is the biggest weakness in terms of this government's uh, Academy's program, and it is that loss of uh, that collaborative ethos. Now, the challenge is how can we get that back in a way that is effective? And that's really what we're grappling with as we prepare our policy offer uh, for next time. It absolutely relates to the points around performance indicators where there's issues about constant change and there's issues about getting them right. Now, I, my sense, not just from today but from other discussions, is we haven't got them right. So they are going to have to change in order to get them right. But I hope we can get to a point where we can get a set of performance indicators to which we are all signed up, and then that can stay and we can have some consistency and stability in the system. Now, I can understand if people smile at that, because politicians have been saying that for a very long time. And this time, as soon you made the point about even value added, which in principle is something that I would still defend as a, as a much more uh, rich and textured measure of the different schools make but that can be gained, and most of these performance indicators can have um, unintended consequences. So getting it right isn't easy. I want to learn from perhaps places that are getting it right more than we are. I'm interested in the stuff the government's published in terms of new accountability measures uh, at GCSE that sound certainly more intelligent than EVAC, and possibly more intelligent than 5A start to see at GCSE, but are very, very complex. And I wonder how easy it would be for parents and the wider public to understand them. But I have a really serious engagement and discussion around what the best indicators of performance are so that we can, in an ideal world, get educationalists and politicians agree on what they are, have them, and then don't change them until things have proved to be badly wrong. That's what I'd like to try to achieve over this next period. Thank you, Stephen. I, I think that's a really good point at which to, uh, to draw the discussion to a close. Thank you so much for all of your questions and, and engaging in uh, what was a very vigorous and, uh, and lively discussion here. I think just to, to try and summarise a lot of what was coming out of the discussion, um, and there are drinks after this if you'd like to stay and to continue discussing in a more informal way, but really I think one of the key things was that um, for talent retention, drawing perhaps some of the parallels from when we finished at the system level to what you might do within your school. I think that actually morale was, was absolutely critical and the message to the profession and to your staff being one about that you are performing well um, and, the, and to rebuild really morale and a sense of uh, achievement in, in their roles. And I think potentially one of the ways to do that, that there was a real, seemed to be a, a uh, a agreement to be made between balancing both empowerment, uh, which there is more autonomy and more empowerment, against the increased accountability uh, frameworks in, in which everybody works, and actually how heads and uh, you know, everyone in the sector can take risks, but take risks in a way that are driven by values and responsibilities, um, and potentially not always doing the easiest thing, or what might be the easiest thing for, for your school um, in, in that particular context. I think some of the interesting points that came out, and it came, came from everybody really, about having a non-hierarchical structure, being absolutely critical and listening and sharing to, uh, to enable all staff to really feel uh, that they're, they're contributing, they're a part of the, the shared vision uh, for the school, and potentially whether we, we have a revolution in job titles to allow behaviours to really come to the fore more than, than potentially uh, the, the roles. And just a couple of thoughts that I had around whether actually 
um, you know, a key way to actually drive middle leaders forward and to keep them wanting to take the next step in the in their leadership journey might be actually to give them the opportunity to take control and to change the system. But that could be a really good motivator to allow people to keep moving on up. Um, and also another thought that if the talent is tied, you know, if your future career is more tied to working in a really high performing school, maybe there's an opportunity for us to re-incentivise the system to actually say, um, I mentioned this that, um, in an article I've written that in Shanghai, one of the things to become a head in Shanghai, you actually have to go and have worked and demonstrated impact in a school that is in really, really challenging context before you can then progress up the system. And maybe we can change our thinking to actually say there is, uh, to, to re-incentivise people to go work in those challenging contexts, and that that should be a key driver um, of career progression rather than going and working in solely outstanding schools. And maybe there's a way for us to, to rethink it. So I'd like to thank, finish by thanking all of you um, and thanking our three panellists for, for what has been a really excellent discussion. If you just show our appreciation. <laughs>